One of the two brothers accused of murdering their parents and three of their siblings in Broken Arrow. Now to a mysterious case unfolding in Oklahoma tonight. A 911 call coming in overnight. Are you the only one there? <laughs> no. My brother's attacking my family. In a lively flashback, Crystal evidently saw her brothers armed and numerous knives spread on their bed. She distinctly heard Michael asking Robert, should we do it now? To which Robert confidently replied with a definite yes. Fueled by a deadly intent, the two brothers maneuvered through their household, methodically turning their ominous nightmare into a horrifying reality. Does it ever cross your mind those chilling scenarios that are too eerie to be anything but a frightful dream? Like your own sibling, conceivably annihilating your whole family? Is such a thought even fathomable? Tragically, for one unsuspecting family, this chilling thought became an unwelcome reality. This tale is about the teenage brothers who infamously stained their hands with the lives of five family members, all in a dire quest for fame. On a distress-filled night of July 22, 2015, the still air of Broken Arrow, Oklahoma was shattered by a daunting 911 call. A distraught boy's voice echoed through the dispatcher's headset, claiming his brother was brutally attacking their family. Broken Arrow 911. Hello? Oh. Hi, where are you at? Broken Arrow, Oklahoma 7411. What address? 709 Magnolia Court. Seven, okay, are you the only one there? No, my brother's attacking my family. No, my Are you there? Hello? Hi, what's going on there? What's going on there? Hello? We're sorry, your call cannot be completed. The operator was instantly engulfed in a cacophony of screams and chaos echoing from the other end of the line. Suddenly, a man's voice broke through, uttering a simple, hello, before the connection abruptly plunged into silence. Quickly, the dispatchers pinpointed the origin of the distressing call to the quiet suburban residence of a 52-year-old, David Bever. Various attempts were made to reach him via the same number, but all calls remained unanswered, fueling growing concerns. David's serene domestic life was shared with his wife, April, 44, and their seven children, spanning the age range of 2 to 18 years. Their children included Robert and Michael, aged 18 and 16 respectively, followed by Crystal, 13, Daniel, 12, Christopher, 7, Victoria, 5, and their youngest, Autumn, only two years old. David had a career in the technology sector and April, a devoted homemaker who homeschooled their children. Despite their large family, the Bevers led a quite private life, engaging mostly within their family activities. Their neighbors only noticed them during their occasional outdoor activities in their backyard or during lawn maintenance. They weren't real social. Their kids were homeschooled, so we didn't see their kids in school. Having wedded David at the tender age of 15, April was an enthusiastic user of Reddit, maintaining her profile under the handle Aoki Mom. Her posts were frequently centered around discussing the experience of raising her seven children and the process of homeschooling them. On several occasions, she portrayed herself as a blend of different emotions, weary, yet joyful, and highly blessed. The depth of her love for her children was evident when she once expressed that there wasn't anything in the world that could persuade her to alter her family in any way. She wrote, I would never give up having any of my children so I could have more money. They are amazing people, and the world will benefit by having them in it. And nothing I could buy or invest in could compare to giving a person a chance to have a life. Conversely, there were concerning reports about David routinely subjecting his children to physical and verbal maltreatment, even going to the extent of hurling them across the room in fits of anger. One night on July 22nd, Around the stroke of 11.30 p.m., Crystal had ventured into Robert and Michael's room to convey their mother's request for them to help with the dishes. This incident would later be etched in Crystal's memory as she recalled the unsettling sight of her brothers dressed in body armor and the unsettling sight of multiple knives strewn across their bed. 
An inquisitive query from Michael to his brother still echoed in her ears. Should we do it now? To which Robert responded, yes. Michael invited Crystal into their room under the pretext of showing her something on his computer. As she entered, the previously unimaginable happened. Her brother Robert, armed with a knife, approached her from behind and launched a brutal assault, slashing her throat. Even though severely wounded in her arms and abdomen by his relentless attack, Crystal managed to escape towards her younger sister's room, instructing her to barricade herself in the bathroom. The chaos attracted the attention of their mother, April, who rushed to investigate. The horrifying realization of her children's actions prompted her to summon the police, but Michael intercepted and subjected her to a horrific sequence of at least 48 knife wounds. Unwatched, the two assailant brothers carried on their bloody rampage room by room. Their father, David, wasn't spared either. A blunt force hit him, preceding a multitude of 28 knife plunges. Discovering Christopher and Victoria seeking safety in the bathroom, they connivingly lured them out, with Michael posing as another victim of this anomaly and pleading for help. The siblings, trying to rescue what they believed was their endangered brother, found themselves meeting a similar gruesome fate at the hands of Robert. Meanwhile, their 12-year-old brother Daniel had managed to secure himself in his room, successfully contacting 911. Exhibiting the same cunning deception, Michael manipulated Daniel to open the door, pretending to be under assault. As soon as Daniel complied, Robert gained access and tragically ended the young boy's life. Daniel was in uh, his room, just you know, down the hall, and I was like, "Let me." How old's Daniel? How old? Um, I think it's I think it's twelve. Okay. And um, I was like, "Let me in." And he let me in. He was sitting down on the phone with the police. I grabbed the phone, you know, which is my phone. I kept my phone. And then I ran into the kitchen and I smashed the underground. During this horrific event, Crystal summoned strength to reach the front door, aiming to trigger the alarm. Her efforts were in vain, however, as the brothers had already deactivated it, leading her to collapse on the front lawn while seeking help outside. Regaining consciousness, she encountered the chilling sight of Michael dragging her back into the house while her younger siblings' cries of terror echoed within. The police arrived on the scene around the same time. The sidewalk and front steps were stained with blood, indicating the carnage within. The pounding on the door was interrupted by a faint cry for help from the inside, a moment that prompted law enforcement to break in. They discovered Crystal, lingering on the edge of life in a shockingly gruesome scene. Before being transported via ambulance, Crystal managed to identify her assailants, her own brothers. As the police meticulously examined the house, they were confronted with the appalling brutality inflicted upon five family members. Evidence of violence was everywhere – face, chest, neck, arms, and abdomen. Amidst this scene of slaughter, the only glimmer of relief was found with two-year-old Autumn, unscathed and innocently asleep in an upstairs room, mercifully unaffected by the grisly proceedings. It's hard to just even imagine why someone would do something like that to a stranger, much less your family. The two brothers tried to vanish into the shadows fleeing the scene of their horrifying act through the backyard, seeking cover in the surrounding woods. The swift action of the police with their trusty canine companions helped to cut their escape short. The officers detained and questioned the brothers. A detective, remembering the unsettling sight of the two boys upon arrest, shared, They weren't upset. They weren't distraught. It's almost like they had a sense of cockiness. It seemed as if the hideous reality of their actions didn't affect them. As another officer pointed out, one of them, probably Robert, even wore an eerie smirk. When the police managed to nab them, the brothers were in a frightful state. Images taken by law enforcement show them drenched in blood and smeared with dirt, their clothes ripped apart. Most sinister were the traces of what seemed to be human flesh that could be seen on them. 11.30 last night, the 911 call comes in. It's silent. No one on the line. When police arrive to investigate, they see two young men running out of the back door of the home. Canines soon track down 18-year-old Robert Beaver and his 16-year-old brother in the woods behind the home. Inside, horror. 
five members of the brothers' family found stabbed to death. Their parents, David and April Beaver, their 12 and 17-year-old brothers, and their five-year-old sister. Two siblings survived the rampage. A 13-year-old sister is in the hospital tonight, and the family's baby, a two-year-old girl, the only one left unhurt. Detectives conducted separate interrogations with the two brothers as they tried to unravel the motives behind the heinous act. Robert, boasting a disturbing sense of pride about his violent actions, openly confessed. He revealed that he and Michael were engrossed with the infamy of serial killers and mass murderers, cultivating a disturbing belief that taking multiple lives would elevate him to godlike status. Robert disclosed his ambition to achieve notoriety, akin to the controversial fame of notorious criminals. He admitted to formulating plans for the family massacre at the tender age of 13, and even obtaining employment at a call center to acquire the necessary funds for the gruesome execution – knives, body armor, helmets, firearms, and ammunition. Their callous scheme entailed wiping out their entire family, even extending to their two-year-old sister. After murder, they intended to beheed the bodies, dispose of the remains in garbage bins, and conceal them in the house's attic. In their meticulous plan, they wanted to film two versions of the aftermath, one showcasing the horrors for the police's eyes and a sanitized one intended for public YouTube consumption. Their dreadful plot encompassed stealing the family car and embarking on a spree of shootings within their town, with the goal of attaining a minimum body count of 50. Chillingly, the detective who interrogated Robert later shared how the boy displayed amusement and even mild enthusiasm while recounting his blood-soaked tale. While Robert's confession remains undisclosed to the public, Michael's admission saw the light of day. In contrast to his older brother, Michael asserted that Robert had influenced and coerced him, saying that Robert had never agreed with the terrible plan, but had threatened him into cooperation. And this is your last chance to just kind of let us know, to be honest, to man up and tell us exactly what you did and, and start hey, making it right. I had Christopher, I did not stab Victoria with Daniel. You did not stab Victoria? Yeah, yeah I, um, I think I had to stab mom. You stabbed him off? Yeah, I got it when she was walking away, I think I had to go for a night, but, you know. Michael shared that Robert, with a chilling level of foresight, had ordered body armor and started collecting knives months prior to the terrifying episode. Additionally, he had arranged for guns to be delivered to a local store, and an eye-popping 3,000 rounds of ammunition were scheduled to arrive at their residence just a day after the tragic incident. Caught in a tug-of-war with the police, Michael initially denied any part in the killings. But the wall of denial eventually crumbled, and he confessed to the chilling acts of stabbing his little brother Christopher and their mother. Apparently, Robert had been very clear-cut about the scheme. The family members were to be eliminated just like ninjas would, suddenly silently, and unseen. However, when faced with the harsh reality of their deadly plan, things soon spiraled out of control. As events unfolded, they were hit with the startling realization that their ominous plan wasn't going to be an easy feat to pull off. Your, your big brother's telling you he wants to be famous and you guys are making these plans. Surely you want some I, of that I fame too, right? Yeah, I do want to do it with him because like, he's going to do it no matter what. He says, if I don't do it with him, they'll just kill me too. Oh, leave me there, so, um, yeah. So y'all have been planning this since 30th of June, you said? Yeah. That's the first time y'all talked about it? Well, not the first time we talked about Blue. I mean, he bought us a light vest. He always said, you would come sour to pillow. I think you'd have to do it. Both Michael and Robert were slapped with serious charges. Five counts of first-degree homicide and one count of assault and battery with an intent to kill. Remarkably, even though Michael was only 16 at the time of the crime, he too was charged as an adult. Adding a twist to the tale, their sister Crystal, a survivor of the attack, courageously took the stand to testify against her brothers. She revealed how Michael and Robert had casually conversed about wiping out their family and usurping their money for over a year. Crystal said that her brothers idolized mass shooters, even wishing more of these criminals escaped the clutches of justice. The brothers, according to Crystal, often shared their misanthropic view that the world was overpopulated, 
She also confessed having raised concerns about their alarming behavior to their mother, only to be patted down with the phrase, boys will be boys. Initially, both brothers decided to play the innocent card, pleading not guilty to the charges stacked against them. However, Robert soon shifted gears and confessed guilt in a bid to dodge the death sentence. Consequently, he received five life sentences, facing a future without any chance of parole. In a disturbing revelation in July 2016, Robert was reported to have attempted to commit suicide by hanging himself with a bedsheet. The alertness of a detention officer during a routine check saved Robert from carrying out his attempted suicide. Mikhail's trial kicked off in April 2018, with Robert making a surprising appearance to testify in his brother's defense. In a dramatic turn of events, Robert shouldered full blame, stating that Mikhail was a mere puppet in his hands. He claimed sole responsibility for the deaths, insisting that Mikhail did not participate in any killings. Robert was on the stand all day long today testifying in his brother Michael's defense. Robert said, looking back, it's unfortunate this plan ever came to fruition. He says, for a long time, the plan wasn't real. It was just something he thought about to make himself feel better. Robert went through the entire chain of events of that night in detail. This was back in July of 2015. He talked about how it started, how it ended, taking responsibility for every death and saying he doesn't even remember seeing Michael holding a knife. Michael's part in the horrendous scenario, Robert confessed that his brother had played a pivotal role in deceiving their siblings into opening their door to doom. Ultimately, Michael's confession and the revelation of his treachery tipped the jury's scales, leading to a guilty verdict. As a result, Michael was charged on all counts and sentenced to lifelong imprisonment without a breath of parole. Presently, he is serving his sentence at the Lexington Correctional Center while his brother Robert is detained at the Joseph Harp Correctional. But hold your horses, the saga doesn't end there. Within the prison, Robert made a scandalous attempt to assault prison personnel by brandishing a sharpened weapon. This audacious act was foiled as the guards, with their hawk-eyed vigilance, managed to restrain him. Meanwhile, during his detention before trial, Michael sketched some truly macabre imagery in his journal, depicting their horrendous deed. The deeply disturbing entries underscored the glaring issues with their mental health. However, despite intensive evaluations by psychiatrists, no definitive explanation emerged to make sense of their distorted psyche. In the aftermath of the events, Crystal and Autumn, the surviving members of the Bever family, found a silver lining. They shared a family through adoption, which gave them comfort in each other's company. This nightmare of an incident continued to cast long shadows over Broken Arrow, with the house becoming the subject of sinister labeling on social media. In a dramatic sequel, two years post the incident, an unidentified person sets the ill-famed house ablaze. Broken Arrow Fire Department says it got the call around 3.30 a.m. When crews arrived, the house was engulfed in flames. It took an hour for them to get it under. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this case. Paint your perspective in the comments below and remember, Hit that like button and ring the subscription bell for more intriguing stories.